This next individual, Tobusanaquat Kinyu, we'll ask the family to come up. He was well known throughout Treaty 3 territory and as well throughout Canada as a strong treaty advocate, rights protector, promoter, pro and fighter. But as well, he was very knowledgeable on ceremonies and the teachings. And uh, again, for me as an individual, it was a pleasure and honor to call him a close friend of mine. Tobosanaquat Kinyu, Dr. Tobosanaquat Kinyu, dedicated his life to the cause of the Anishinaabe Nation, First Nations, and educating all Canadians about Indigenous peoples, our rights, and our teachings. He was a pipe carrier and sun dancer. His insight into the connections between traditional knowledge and contemporary teachings allowed him to reach across cultures and generations to build bridges of understanding. Dr. Kinyu was a firm believer in education for our youth. He was a survivor of residential schools and his ability to overcome and transcend that experience while never forgetting the impact it had on First Nations people was inspiring to all. Dr. Kinyu was a true leader. He served as chief of his community, the Ojibwe's of Onigmanig, First Nation, Ogichita of Grand Council Treaty Number no. 3, and Regional Chief for the Chiefs of Ontario. Many will remember his visit with former National Chief Phil Fontaine to meet with Pope Benedict the 16th at the Vatican in 2009. Dr. Kinyu served with the University of Winnipeg as an elder, an instructor in the Master of Arts in Indigenous Governance, and Masters in Development Practice with a focus on Indigenous Development. The University of Winnipeg honored Elder Kinyu with an honorary Doctorate of Laws in 2011. The AFN is grateful to, to Bosanaquat for his legacy and to his wife and family for supporting his efforts on matters most paramount to Indigenous peoples. Colin Wobb, can you come up? Thanks to Tupusanaquat. Oh, bonjour. Bonjour, and then I'm going to talk. Well, by the quick nigo, quick, quick, keep it ass kids, I'll be talking about our Indigenous cars. Bonjour, go shot and do it them. Kagi, what the so nigga ming and don't jay. The chi by Mateo, Nigi Sagi Buzz. Tabasana quit Kijinikazo and Dete Ban. Apache Nijoe in mind, Dete Ban. Nongum, Majendam, Nimigo Scat and Dam Menoa. Kain Ninga, Wab Ma, see Menoa in Dete Ban, Homa King. Miigwech, ke miigwech ui e ne nem in the kit, and then away maga anak. To my Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota relatives, I would like to say how mataki api, the shunka luta wakati a machi apelo. So that's two languages down, 68 more indigenous languages to go. You know, I uh, graciously uh, listened to the words that Perry said, and there were many aspects of my father's life that we could pay tribute to. His work, co-founding role with the National Indian Brotherhood and the Grand Council of Treaty 3, his work in education, perhaps most potently in his modeling true grace and courage by embracing his former residential school tormentors as his brothers with love and dignity towards the end of his life. But there's a story that I wanted to share with you guys to really shed some light onto my father's legacy. I took my sons to Boston Pizza not too long ago. And as anybody here with kids knows, they keep a box of toys at the front. Kids love to go raid that. So my son, Pejigomi Guan, Lone Feather, 
He's digging in this box of toys, and then he, he pulled out a bag of cowboys and Indians. And he showed it to me, and he said, Wow, Dad, look, cowboys and Anishinaabe. <laughs> Some people talk about colonization and decolonization. Well, my sons have never been colonized. And that is a legacy of my father. That is the legacy of Tabasana Kwiti Bun and the memory that I hope we preserve. You know, my mother is having a tough time this being close to the first anniversary of his passing, as are my elder and younger sisters. And so that's the, why, that's the reason why I am the one up here by myself. My father prepared us for his passing. And he told us, I know you are going to cry when I leave. I know you're going to cry when you go to the Sundance without me. But he said, don't cry too long. Don't be carrying on. He said, be proud, be stoic, be like a Treaty 3 Anishinaabe. So I'm the only one who could pull that off. So I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. But you know, we had, a, we had a magical time together in those final months before he passed away. And uh, I made sacrifices. I left a, a job with security and good pay that put me on national TV. I left that to spend time with him. My sister came back from doing her PhD coursework in Italy to spend time with him. And we spent many awesome days and nights visiting with each other. And I'll tell you, that is one of the most sacred gifts that we can experience is to spend those final days and weeks with somebody we love. You know, as uh, we sat there, we went through a leveling process. All the things that you think are important in life, they disappear. They cease to matter. You know, I was really upset one night seeing his condition, and I was thinking, maybe if I, if I go get like five grand out of the bank and give it to him, that'll help. Which you realize how ridiculous it sounds close to the end of someone's life. That it starts to be bewildering why we spend so much time worrying about money in our healthy years. So money didn't matter. As we got closer to the end, he didn't differentiate between his Anishinaabe and his white friends. He didn't say, no, today I'm only seeing Ojibwe's. No, anyone who was there he would visit with. Idle No More was reaching its apex. But in trying to talk about that with him, I recognized that politics had ceased to matter as well. And then we got into those final moments. Food was important, but then he couldn't eat. Water was important for a time after that, but then he couldn't drink. And then he was just breathing, and air mattered. But then he ceased to breathe. For a time there, he was still alive. And then he exhausted the final resource, time. And then he was gone. So what remained then? Love. The love that he had for us and the love that we had for him. And that's still here. Apache ni joeni ma in de te ibun. Keabe. And so I share that message with you guys today because that is the gift that my father gave me, the final one that he gave me. And I hope it is one that we can all all share. Yes, spend the time with your loved ones while they are still here. Help them as they make the journey to the spirit world. But let's also remember those lessons while we are still alive. What is the difference between a few billion dollars between relatives? What is the difference between treaty and non-treaty? Comprehensive claims, this process, that process, idle no more, the AFN. Are we not all human beings? Are we not all Anishinaabe? Are we not all united in our common purpose and common desires? Yes, we are. Ahom.
and then we are going to talk. Miigwech, in the kit. Metaki ase. Barney, fantastic. I believe we do have a video. Do we have a video for our final? And then following that, we'll gather the family in the front of your first ceremony. This is where I went to school. That's where the school was, right here. And there was a statue here. And this is where we prayed. But I couldn't run because I was, the wind was out of me. <laughs> That's my father and son. It's a scene that plays out for Canadian families everywhere. A grandfather laughing while sharing some old memories. In Ojibwe, we have a word, Don Kobitagan, that explains how the generations in a family are linked together like a thread. But in my family, those ties were nearly severed. It's a story of physical and sexual abuse, alcoholism, suicide, infidelity, and finally, redemption. This is my family story, and it starts right here at St. Mary's Residential School. St. Mary's Indian Residential School opened in Kenora, Ontario in 1894. It was run by the Oblates until 1962 when it closed. My father, Tubasonaquit, was brought here by his parents when he was seven. And in an attempt to get rid of his Anishinaabe language and heritage, the priest who registered him renamed him. And that's how I got that name, Peter Kelly. Yeah. And this is, the, this is how I was registered. Then after that, I was given this number 54, which stayed with me all the way, all the years that I spent in residential school. By now, we've all heard the stories from residential schools. My father didn't escape the horrors. When he was nine years old, one of his teachers, a nun, called him to her bedroom. You know, she jumped on top of me, she began humping me, and she said, that's all your people are good for, is to fucking. That's what, that's what she said, you know. And uh, for about a couple of weeks, I didn't know whether I had been raped. I didn't know whether I had been uh, beat up, you know. I didn't know what had happened. He was depressed for weeks and was afraid to return to her classroom for the rest of the year. But he had no choice. But I could not understand the giver, givers of the teachings of God, how they behaved. He left St. Mary's at the age of 15. And like many survivors, he turned to alcohol to escape his confusion and pain. This is the famous couches at the reserve. They're still, I think we just threw them out last year. <laughs> <laughs> Diane Kelly is the Grand Chief of Treaty 3 in Northwestern Ontario. She's also my older sister from my dad's previous marriage. I grew up with her, but she was more like an aunt because her kids were the same age as me. When she was a child, though, she saw our dad at his worst. He was a violent alcoholic. The pain is still there. Even talking about it today, it, it, mm -hmm. uh, it's very disturbing. Um, you know, I, I love my father deeply, but there's a piece of my life that was uh, profoundly impacted by some of the events in, in my childhood. Uh, and I also don't have my brothers here. So this is you, Danny and Daryl. Danny passed away in a car accident a few years earlier. He took his own life. Yeah, four years early, four years apart. The trauma that they experienced and uh, the lack of coping skills uh, might have led to, to their ultimate um, short life. Losing someone that you held in your arms when they were a little baby, when they were two years old, five years old when you, you held them and they're gone. And it's unbelievable. The pain is just totally unbelievable. And this is where the, uh, the opening is. Being taken from his home at a young age meant he was raised by people who didn't love him. And so he never learned what it meant to be a parent. It's my dad's cross. Is it? Yeah. Right there, that's where my dad's buried. So were you, when they buried him, were, were you actually out here? Standing around the grave? grave? We, I was over there. My grandfather died after being hit by a car in 1947 and was buried in a cemetery at St. Mary's. My dad was allowed to attend the funeral. 
But an hour later, he was called back to an assembly and beaten by a nun in front of his peers. His transgression, standing beside his father's coffin, as is the Ojibwe custom, rather than kneeling like a good Catholic. When she started beating me up, I resolved that I'm, I'm not going to cry. If that's your best shot, you know, you don't know what I'm going through here and seeing my father being buried. Yeah. And this physical pain that I'm feeling, that's nothing compared to what I, what I feel. It's okay, that the... Yeah. Rediscovering his emotions has been a long journey for my father. It's a very tough one. Yeah. A journey that took him to the highest seat of the religion that was at the center of his darkest moments. He was part of a delegation that heard the Pope express his sorrow over residential schools. It was that meeting and a return to his traditional beliefs that led to his salvation. These are Sundance scars. They come from a ceremony that my dad has been doing for years and he actually introduced me to. It's considered the ultimate offering in our culture when you give of your own flesh to the Creator. And it's considered so sacred that they don't allow any pictures to be taken. What it is is a summertime ceremony where you fast and dance for four days. At the end of those four days, they cut your flesh and tie those piercings to a procession of a dozen buffalo skulls. Then you pull those skulls around the outside of a circle hundreds of feet wide. The ceremony helped them deal with the loss of my brothers. The pain that my son would have gone through as he was dying. And uh, all my loved ones when they died, that pain that they've gone through. I went through that pain of pulling buffalo skulls. Right in the middle of this heavy conversation, we're joined by a visitor. And how come they came? Yeah, this is uh, what Nishnabek say when you're going through a lot of pain. The Creator puts something in front of you to make you forget your pain. Put your hand out, see if you can touch him. There he goes. <laughs> hey. <laughs> As our day of discovery wraps up at St. Mary's, see all these guys on the school here. Yeah. My dad shows his grandson some pictures of his childhood. Migizi. Migizi, the Anishinaabe word for bald eagle. The second good omen soars overhead of where St. Mary's used to stand. And there were little guys there just like you. My son is five years old now. He's the age kids were when they were taken away from their families. When I look at him and I see how frail he is, I wonder if he could take a beating from an adult like my dad did. I hear him cry for his mom sometimes, and I wonder if he could survive for 10 months without his parents. Seeing my son at this age makes my father's residential school experience hit home. I understand why he screwed up so much later in life, and I forgive him. Now it's up to me to make things a little bit better for my son. Wab Canoe. CBC News, Kenora. I hope, uh, I hope you guys like that video. We spent a lot of money hiring that deer and that eagle. <laughs> I just one more time want to thank the AFN, the Youth Council, the uh, Women's Council, and the Elders Council. And of course, I want to, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge and thank and say a key him in to my uh, dear uncle, Kijé Bao Se Makwa, Fred Kelly. You guys could uh, give him a round of applause. Not to protract the, uh, the ceremony too much longer, there's a couple of things I wanted to share with you. As I said, there are many great leaders that my brother and I have worked with and knew over the years. We started working with uh, Walter Dieter, and we worked with people, great, 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 brilliant leaders, like Dave Cushane. His son is here with us. Dave, you want to take a bow? And his brother, Elmer, is also here. Take a bow. We worked with, uh, I've had the privilege of working with all of the uh, national chiefs, including the current one, in, in different uh, capacities. But going back to my uh, own brother, I just say to him, Nietzsche, this is a moment of the ages in your memory, and there's a couple of things that I just have to share with you, because as brothers, 
This man was supposed to go to the Golden Gloves until uh, tuberculosis uh, got him. And so he taught me how to fight as well, but he was a tough man. We had to fight on the streets in Kenora. We had our own street patrol searching the uh, nooks and crannies in the back alleys looking for our people who might get beat up. And if they were attacked, then we were there. And he was a tough man. He taught me how to box. And I uh, use this line to Billy Two Rivers every now and then, a professional wrestler that I've also worked with over the years, and I use this line to him. I never lost a fight to Vasanakut as tough as he was. In fact, I won my last fight by 100 yards. <laughs> and he told me in August, the year that he passed away, uh, he passed away December 23rd of last year. And he told me in August, he says, this I know now, he says, this is going to take me. He says, I don't want you to be sad. I want you to use that song that you were singing so beautifully at other people's funerals. He said, I don't want you to be sad. And I told him, I said, well, it comes naturally. I can't help it. And he said, well, I don't want you to cry. He said, you're ugly enough as it is naturally. Me <laughs> which. Miigwech, everyone. We will have uh, Fred will take us through a ceremony here with the family. We'll invite the family to join Fred in the ceremony. And uh, I guess once Fred is completed, we'll uh, adjourn for the day. Testing. Microphone. Do we have the floor mic, please? Testing. Testing. The actual part of the uh, traditional ceremony is that as the plaques were given and the memorials, the testimonials were rendered, we acknowledge that we have lost great leaders amongst others. And we have a traditional ceremony in our way, which is called warrior down. When a warrior falls, the nation gathers. When you lose a chief, as these people were, great leaders, grand chiefs, chiefs in their own way and leaders, beautiful people. So I want to uh, call on the, uh, the family members, or those that accepted the, uh, the plaque, what we do is these feathers lie here in their memory, which represents the fact that they are down. But by picking up the feathers and passing them on and retiring them into the forest or into our homelands and our traditional territories, we will always remember that their hearts, Elijah, Jim, Jabosanakut, their hearts came from the land. And with this feather and their spirits being raised, their hearts are also being acknowledged as being, continuing to be a part of that land that they so loved and fought for. And that's why we pick up the feathers now so that their spirits, we are raising their spirits again into the eternal world, the spirit world that we will all be heading for. And they are with us and they are watching it. So I will... Uh, be doing a song after these uh, feathers have been passed. So I will ask these, uh, the young man, the lady, and the uh, elder to come back down here and accept these feathers who will pass them back on to, their, to the families. And I'm asking that these families will see fit in their own time to tie these feathers onto a tree that they can remember as being a favorite tree of uh, Jim, Elijah, and to Vasanakut. And they will hang them there as a tribute, and then when they fall down, then that means that they, we will not forget them. But that means that we are trying to deal with our grief and get over our grief because we must remember that they are in a timeless spirit world, spirit world, where they have no pain, 
where they have no longer need to talk about love and perfection. They are love and perfection and happiness. And so I will ask the, uh, the, the people here to uh, bring up the, uh, uh, the people who accepted the plaques to accept the feather, okay? First one is uh, the young man over here from the Youth Council. Our youth will uh, celebrate the memory and the life of uh, Jim Sinclair. A family member from and then we will go to to Wasanaquit. and just stay here with us for uh, for a moment and then we will go. Then we will go to Elijah. To you, Jim, to Wasanakut Nietzsche, Elijah, you are all friends of mine, personal friends of mine. I worked with you. I fought alongside of you. We were there at the Constitutional Talks. You were eloquent. I've never heard a more eloquent no than the one that came from Elijah. Resonates and echoes through generations and we will never forget. Tavasanaquit, a man that fought against the legacy of colonialism. And he fought against the four men of the indigenous apocalypse. the missionary, the game warden, the policeman, and the Indian agent. And the, all of these people that we are commemorating, the common denominator that they were fighting for is what we call, in some fancy terms, sovereignty, inherent right of self-determination, they fought for those with passion, with fire, has been said, in their hearts. And they left those with us to continue. And as the song said, they are still loving us. They are still watching us. And they will guide us as they tried to do in the, while they were with us. And I also take this opportunity to pick up the other feather, a man whose family is not here, biological family is not here. But I want you to know that he became our brother, the late Nelson Mandela. The Vasanakut and I had the honor at the behest of the then National Chief Phil Fontaine and the staff at the time, on behalf of all the people in Canada, to present him with this picture that was supposed to be up there. <laughs> well, it isn't. So, he isn't here, even in picture. So there he is. And that jacket that we gave him, it was about 100 degrees at the Sky Dome. When we gave him that jacket, now you will know that the jacket, a woolen jacket, comes from the grandmother spider that sits in the middle of the sky, connects all the stars, forming the dream catcher that catches all the evil and 
prevents it from going through, but allows the good to come through. And that is the symbol of the woolen blanket that we gave him. And he proudly wore it. In our little conversation back, as we gave him that, I told him, I said, Mr. Mandela, do you agree that government does not empower, freedom empowers? And his beautiful, eloquent response was, yes, I agree with you. And we must remember when we take over government, when we take over our government, let those words sink in. When we take over our own government and when we take over back this land, the challenge is for us to remain kind and compassionate. Let that ring into your hearts because these four men that we are honoring today all stood for the one common denominator, which is freedom. And that's what you're fighting for, for the sake of our people today and for the sake of our future generations. And that's what these feathers are for. Now that their spirits, we're celebrating them, and their spirits again have risen, and they are watching. And I will do a song, a thank you song, in their memory, thanking each and every one of them for the great work and the inspiration that they have provided us with on this earth and that we keep fighting for. Miigwech.